All right, I'm looking at the Richmond weekend here. Now, I'm recording this on Wednesday. I understand the hurricane is going through uh, between now and then. Most of it will hit the Richmond area, and you know, mainly the major part of the storm will be west of Richmond. However, uh, most of the rain should hit Friday. At the moment, we are expecting on-track activity Friday. Just saying, that can change. I'm not a weatherman, not my job, and nor is it my job 72 hours before the weekend to even predict what's going to be going on. So if there are, if there is no on-track activity, well, then we're just going off of starting positions, gentlemen. Secondly, really fast, if you are looking for a weather app to use, this is not sponsored, not affiliated in any form or fashion, use Radar Omega. Okay, if you're using some free software or, like, if you're not getting information from Radar Omega, I, it's absolutely useless. Absolutely useless. It's the main thing that real meteorologists use, real storm chasers use, and people that I know that I trust use it. And, you know, it's a paid subscription. Like, use Radar Omega. That's what a lot of the race teams use. If you want a clue of what the weather is doing at any given point, at any given time, use Radar Omega. Don't use any of the free weather.com stuff. Like, how many times have people been wrong of like, oh, I don't think there's going to be anything in the area this week. Just use Radar Omega. If you're not using that, I don't want to hear anything about weather in your opinion. Um, secondly, when we're looking at two races this weekend, the first one is the Truck Series at Richmond this week. And when I just look at it, you know, very quickly entering this weekend, you know, the the four, you know, the last four races that we've been at are pretty good indicators of where these guys should line up okay you can argue the you know the higher wear racetrack of richmond and what that offers can be different from what we're seeing in other places but you know for me the sample size of these four races is pretty good to get an indication of where these guys are at um i just i'm hit and miss with short tracks that's why i don't do my uh excel file or not my excel file my my personal sheet ranking just because i just you know i i swing and miss on short tracks all the time so like that's just where i'm at um so that's why i'm just defaulting to you know using the good old racing reference of where we're at here not nothing majorly surprising i mean we only have like 31 guys who have been on here pretty sure it's like 33 or 34 racing reference normally misses some guys um that's just how it is you know how you know they are uh yet again recording this uh midday at, on wednesday so we know how to price it out for any of these races, but you know, that's not really a major thing here when we're looking at the race for Richmond. Also, secondly, like I'm not cuckoo here, right? Like we've seen NASCAR.com lie to us uh, several times already this year of laps and distances uh, entering uh, these race weekends, but this one is absolutely for sure 250 laps. Um, like this is where the guys are and this is where everybody should be. I, I'm, I would not, exp or I would be shocked to not see, Ekas Majeski and Corey Heim uh, pushing high 10,000s, you know, anywhere from probably 10 to 4 to 11K. Uh, not too um, worried. Why, why, why does everybody call me? As soon as I start recording, I'm on a live show. Like, what are we doing? Completely lost my train of thought. Uh, I would be very shocked if we don't see them in the high uh, 10K range. Looking at at how this race could end up playing out. And we look at these previous races here, which, you know, let's go ahead and, and kind of review, which, you know, when we're looking right at 250 laps, you know, Wilkesboro, uh, IRP, and Martinsville, both at, you know, 200, and, and certainly North, North Wilkesboro um, being right at, you know, very, very, or being right on the amount of laps we're going to need um, gives us a good indication of just kind of how these races are breaking up this year based on laps led and, you know, how many, you know, more expensive guys do we need? Uh, the reason why I'm very much including Gateway here is because when we're focusing on cars rotating through the corners and stuff, uh, Gateway is a very good indication of that because that's clearly all what that track is. Like, come on, man. Well, I'm not going to get into the semantics here, but that's, I'm perfectly fine with these four. Um, we'll debate some more stuff when we're talking about the, the Cup Series going up. But when we look at the Truck Series, I just want to look at the amount of laps led and where these guys started and finished. You know, when we look at IRP, and we look at the truly, like, realistically, the luck that kind of Majeski had getting through and leading this many laps here. We had several guys run into pit lane issues. We had several guys who really got screwed over uh, by being on a different strategy. Like, when we look at Corey Heim and the way that he got stuck through the field, uh, you know, had a tire go down. Luckily, had a yellow come out. He got the lucky dog. Was able to drive through the field pretty decently until the tires fell back off and he fell back down to 17th. He was driving up through the field, um, and I do not believe this is a true indication of where 
Corey Heim was at, I do believe he was very much a, a top, you know, at least a top seven contender. Hard to really separate. Like, that's more lean into just kind of where I'm thinking he's at. Because when you look at these lap times, you, you know, we, we very easily see that, you know, Corey Heim was like, you know, the anywhere from like 9th to 13th fastest. But when you look at what Corey Heim ended up having to go through, you know, we do have that issue. Or we do have that happening there. We have Infinger who was able to uh, get to lead. And we, when we actually look at the breakdown of these leaders, we see that we end up changing them quite a lot here. That's uh, point stands. When we look at the lap leaders, we end up changing them quite a lot. And we see Majeski come in late. Very, very late in this race. Um, and what I mean, you know, changing these by a lot, like Infinger was starting second, if I do believe. Yeah. Um, ends up getting around, you know, Raja Karuth, uh pretty easily. Like, not even, like, Raja starting on the pole based on what we saw in practice just in this race here and what we, or at least what I was looking at, like, there, there, there's, like, no head-to-head contest between Raja and, and Infinger here. Infinger clearly had the better car throughout practice regardless of the fact that it was at two different times you know like the practice data very much showed where these guys should have lined up and should have ended up being these guys were the the uh better cars in practice and we were able to see that and finger quickly got around raja caruth had a much better short run car and then just a faster car in general to, to raja and was able to get around him and the reason why i'm saying that is you know Majeski, Eckes, Infinger, and Corey Heim, when we start looking at more of these races, like this is where these guys are at. We see Infinger at six. These are your three primary guys that we want to target. Now, for me, I'm a little bit more hesitant on getting to Ty Majeski, you know, and I mean, we're just talking about IRP. But when we look at what Ty Majeski has done at these tracks and where we've been at, I would argue that these are kind of inflated... You know, and and pretty much disappointments here, okay? You know, j- just speaking out loud, we, you know, whether it was due to um, sheer just dominating IRP and knowing how to build setups for that track, you, I would argue that, where are we at with IRP? I would argue that Majeski, you know, only getting to the lead at this point in the race, which is here, lap 145, that, that, that's... A lot of, lot of kinks in the armor there, you know. If we're envisioning him, and yet again, he won the previous race at RP, but you would argue that this is a bit of a disappointment in terms of how, you know, he was able to get to lead and how fast he was able to do that. Like, that's really concerning that he truly got to it at the last 25% of this race. When we're looking at what he did off the pole at both, um, I gotta go here. When we look at what he did off the pole at both Martinsville and Gateway, Yet again, you know, say what you will about Gateway being involved here, but when we look at Martinsville and Ty Majewski starting first, like, you would kind of envision him to lead more if he did have a better car. Now, granted, you know, he finishes second. Like, that's nothing bad. But when we're looking at a situation where Majewski might be like 10-8, 10-6, 10-9, somewhere around there, he's he's probably going to be the second. It's probably going to be Heim, Majewski, the Eckes, I'd have to assume, with how salary would probably end up coming out. And so when we look at, you know, Majeski being here, I would say that Majeski's kind of underperforming, and we're getting to a situation where you might end up having a realistic projection of, Maj- of Majeski scoring like 62 DraftKings points, and that's probably the second, or he's probably defaulting to the second highest projected guy on the slate uh, based on you know the expectation entering this race with 250 laps. Probably not going to get the pole. And honestly, I'd probably prefer Majeski if he doesn't get the pole. Uh, I'm I'm actually very concerned if Majeski starts first in this race, just from you know looking at this stuff and just going through, speaking out loud of where we're at on Wednesday. Would know, you know, as I said, might I practice, might not. I'm just saying, you know, kind of where I'm at right now. Um, past that, no surprise that it is um, Eckes and Corey Heim and and Majeski as your favorites. I mean, as I said, Corey Heim did underperform at. IRP, but I think that was due to a multitude of reasons. Uh, when we look at where he ended up being or what he ended up doing at Wilkesboro and Gateway, you know, like these guys are, are pretty, pretty even. There's not one guy like running away with any of these races. And it's the same fucking dudes leading races in all these. It's, it's Corey Heim. It is Christian Eckes. It is Ty Majeski. Let, let's go through these three races together just really fast. Like let, let's actually look at this in like a projection based standpoint like what are what are we projecting these these guys for okay and this is yet again almost where 
this stuff from like a projection based standpoint is you know kind of useless and it just go it, it really just turns into more of like a construction because he's either going to work or he's not going to work so we look at like you know we look at martinsville there are two lap leaders ekis and majeski okay that, that's pretty much it sure sanchez led one whatever it's it's these two guys okay nothing else from you know anybody else you can you can argue whatever you know Corey heim did starts fourth finishes 10th zero here we go. We end up going to North Wilkesboro. What happens here? We end up having Corey Heim lead sixty six. We end up having Christian Eckes lead sixty two. Majeski leads fifty. Jake RC on strategy and staying out uh, leads forty. Ankrum leads twenty four. Okay, and so these guys were pretty much an identical play. Okay, in terms of practically the same amount of laps led, and then it's just coming to where. Guys started based on the higher floor and higher projection, you know, than like Corey Heim was the better play at Wilkesboro. You can and we go back and we look at Martinsville. The the best play was uh Christian Eckes who started up front. And I'm just saying that it was very much probably a situation where all these guys projected to do the exact same. Because regardless of where they start, you have to pretty much project them to finish in the top three. When we look at uh when we look at the gateway race, yet again. Who's leading races here? Who's leading laps? Oh, it's the same guys. So Majeski leads 65, or Heim leads 65, Majeski 43, uh, and this is the one where I believe Ekis ran to issues or just didn't lead, if I remember correctly. He just didn't lead. He didn't, you know, didn't have a good race. Ran second all day, literally just couldn't get the lead from anybody. Everybody else was just, just basically led uh, from him. Like, he, he was just never able to get the lead. But as we continue to go on... And we get to the IRP race, you know, yet again, Majeski, 56, Ekis, 73. Now, you can argue Enfinger, you know, leading 71. As I said, he's probably, you know, the fourth or fifth interest or interesting guy going into this race. You can see that, you know, Corey's led nothing here. And so, like, when we're looking at where guys are projecting for, you project these three guys to finish first, second, third. Uh, the, you know, details of who finishes what is, is kind of irrelevant. They are all going to, like, by default project for, like, probably 48 laps led or so, okay? Maybe Corey Heim a bit lower, okay? And so probably the big favorites entering this race by way of consistency might be Ty Majeski. He might be end up, he might end up being the most expensive. Um, X and Heim, whatever. The, the whole point is wrapping around, too. When we're looking at these guys from a projecting based standpoint, we're seeing that, like... Finishing potentials in the top four, clearly, duh. Laps led, you know, is kind of irrelevant in terms of what the actual number is. We're seeing that these guys are the main contenders. As I said, project them all for like 48 laps led is a pretty decent projection, okay? Because I think that's pretty much kind of where everybody's going to fall in line at in terms of potential upside or potential likelihood of them leading, leading laps since we haven't just seen one of them truly want to run away with the race. Outside of Martinsville, but when you're looking at like a projection-based standpoint, like 48 is a pretty decent projection for all these three guys. Combine that with where they're going to end up starting. You know, clearly the guy who starts farther back between the three are probably going to you know project to 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 be higher. You know, and then it just comes down to do they end up leading? Do they lose lose projection? So you know, it's kind of stupid to say, but. There is no difference between Majeski, Ekis, and Corey Heim. It's just going to come down to line of construction. Like, and if you build with them, you know, clearly you need them to work. Clearly you don't need them to work. So, like, that's not even, like, the important aspect of this Richmond race. Okay? That'll be determined post-Q, where we'll know everybody's starting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the real thing is going to come down to what do these idiots in the back do and how do you build uh, for that if we're expecting to at least nail two lap leaders, which is... Easily two of these three guys, like, duh, that's the projection. Um, side note, if anybody else starts up front, yet again, we saw Infinger was able to back up the practice speed, not relative to Ekis or Majeski, but when you're looking head-to-head -head between the guy starting first and the guy starting second, and we're looking at guys who were priced lower or at least not not even mispriced, but like they're not 10k. Um, this is speaking on the IRP decision between Raja Karuth and 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 Enfinger. What I did was I went ahead and looked at their practice laps, 
and looked at like you know the takeoff speed of like what is their short run speed and we saw that Grant Infinger had a much faster and a much more consistent car than Raja Karuth. For me, that's just kind of what I leaned on. And so if we get like some guy who doesn't deserve to be up there or somebody who starts up front who really shouldn't be up there, like a Tanner Gray, a Chase Purdy. Also, this is the cutoff race too, so we're going to have guys doing stupid shit, staying out for stage points and getting crazy and stuff. So yet again, hey man, maybe a good situation to play Ben Rhodes because the guy will probably start 14th. Um, and just, you know, he's swinging for the fences. Um it, it, it's mainly going to come down to whoever, who, who offers, you know, place differential, who offers the, the, the higher floor for the value plays for me. Because if I'm paying up for two of these guys, we're most likely going to be punting at the bottom of the field in some form or fashion. I, I you know, we're, we're, we're looking at um, probably a situation where we're having to use, like, Brett Holmes as a value and or we're also seeing a lot of 6K guys, like, actually be viable in these races People like Matt Mills. People like uh, Daniel Dye. Caden Honeycutt's probably going to be in the 7, 8K range and stuff too. And so, like, you know, very long-winded way to just say, like, guys, it just depends. Or it comes down to where they're at on the starting grid and what their potential upside is. Like, that. that's where it's at. That, that's my extent of my, my preview and stuff. Um, but I, I don't think there's any true separating value or separating thing between Ekus, Ty Majeski, and Corey Heim. Each of these three guys can work, and I think they're pretty much in identical plays. Um, I think there is a slight gap between Heim and the other two. It's like Heim is probably the third favorite coming into this race in terms of what he's you know consistently doing and able to leave laps, but like still he has the most wins of these two. Or, or in these four races, and so like these guys are, are pretty pretty identical. Even when you look at laps led, yeah, sure, two wins out of Corey Heim, led races in a race that had less laps, so like clearly that's going to lean towards Ekus and Majeski, but like these guys are pretty much identical. Um, in finger all, this is just from one lap. Everybody else is pretty uh, pretty much the same. Garcia stayed out and got off sequence at Wilkesboro, and so when you start looking at this field, this is pretty much where they line up, okay? Your three favorites, clearly. Ankrum Finishing, like, 7th every time, you know, 6th to 7th, if he's $9,000, you know, 92, 93, real chance he's scoring, like, you know, 43, 44 points, like, right at value, right under, so it kind of removes him from the equation. We're probably not playing Sanchez because we're playing, we're paying up for guys, and so everything else is going to be decided in this range here with, you know, and then that, at that point, I don't want to use just, like, one statistic and stuff. But at that point, like, who's actually getting through the field and who's actually, like, finishing decently? Like, Jack Wood, you know, um, Dean Thompson, the other, like, Dean Thompson, like, 13th best guy. Like, this is where you should, like, realistically have these guys projected to finish and stuff. So, like, if Dean Thompson starts 22nd, going to be a good play. Any of the Tricon guys, you know, messing up a queue, going to be a good play. The two Nice cars, you know, if they mess up and they start farther back like you're going to want to play Caden Honeycutt you're going to want to play uh Matt Mills like that that's that's where it's coming down to um and so anyway like that that's me looking at the truck series we'll you know we'll, we'll just get to the uh we'll get to Q and focus on from there but I mean it's 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 these three guys so probably two of them or one if we need a shitload of place differential you know and that you know that's really it we don't need to really go um, any farther than that. When we start looking at the Cup Series, yet again, I'm recording this on Wednesday, salary isn't out. We don't know the state of the weather that will be there. We're expecting it to be pretty much moved out of the area by then, but I would not be shocked to see some, you know, scattered showers or whatever disrupt the Saturday stuff. Potentially, maybe even a doubleheader on, on Sunday, yet against the weather. God does whatever he wants to do, okay? I, we don't understand weather, and it's uh, 2024. That's kind of embarrassing from a human, from a humanitarian standpoint or a humanity standpoint, but when we start looking at the Cup Series, now for me, yet again, when when you're breaking stuff down, I'm, I'm really, I like being aggressive on recent um, finishes and recent production. Okay, as we enter, you know, halfway through the season, as we enter pretty much the second half of the season, as we're getting close to the playoffs, we're on this, you know, third year of this car, and so at this point, this is where, speaking out loud, if you wanted to start using old races, it's very much only next-gen cars, right? 
Like, we're not using Gen 4 data. That's just stupid. We're not doing any of that, okay? And yet again, I don't go down this road, but I, this is a point where I would start understanding if you wanted to start doing that. Um, so you'd want to look at, you know, what these guys are doing in this car at Richmond, which we're seeing that kind of flip-flop. I mean, we've seen, you know, the Joe Gibbs cars kind of be the dominant team there, but still even between them when you're dissecting each of those races or each of those drivers on previous races, still kind of fishy, you know, different learning aspects in 2021, 2022. Actually, 2022 was the first year of the next-gen car, so it would just be 2022 onward and stuff. And so for me, I'm still I'm still more concerned with, with looking at recent uh, races and, and data points like that. Now, yet again, if I'm just using, you know, race and reference, if you go back six races, you know, then we're stuck including Dover, right? If you go eight... We're, we're, we're getting stuck using Bristol and Dover, okay? So for me, you know, which is perfectly fine, you know, but, because, I mean, I like looking at the short track data in and of itself. I typically try to remove Bristol, and then, you know, stupid Dover just sneaks in here because it's a mile track, so I would remove that. But then, you know, that's a lot of not being lazy, not wanting to do that, but, like, you know, for, for a visual aspect here, like, if we're using these races here, I mean, this has both Bristol and Dover included, okay? This is including Bristol, and so for me, like, you know, we're, we're seeing where these guys are at, but we're seeing them be bumped by Dover and, and Bristol, and we can really see that out loud when we start looking at just the last three short tracks that we've been at, you know, Gateway, Iowa, and Loudoun, and I understand this isn't a true, you know, yet again, like, you know, when you're going through and dissecting what tracks, like, ideally, you'd want to use Phoenix, the previous Richmond race, Martinsville, Gateway, Iowa, and Loudoun, but yet again, I mean, this is back in... My guys, this is this is an old race. Phoenix was a long time ago. Richmond was a long time ago. I mean, this is this is going back to the far date of you know March. This is a long time. We're in August. We just got off a two week break. Now I'm not saying you're going to make a lot of adjustments on your team in two weeks because for the most part these cars were already set up even before the Olympic break. All right. As soon as we ended with whatever track we last raced at, Indy, whatever the case was, like all the shop guys. We're like, okay, you know, man, guys, we got like three weeks off off. Let's go ahead and get the Richmond race car prepared. Let's get the Michigan car prepared. And at this point, we understand what race, what what car we're going to sacrifice to Daytona, right? So we're looking at farther things. And so, like, you're not just, like, spending these two weeks on Richmond, on, on this car you're bringing to Richmond. Like, this is, this is already done, okay? And so, like, even when we look back at the last Richmond race, okay, like, are we really seeing anything more insane than this? This is where these guys finished, right? But when you look at this standing and, and the finishing order of this race, Hamlin, Logano, Larson, Truex, Elliott, Bell, Byron, Keselowski, Busher, Reddick, are you seeing anything, like, out of the ordinary here between, like, is there anything truly crazy here? Like, is anybody here who shouldn't be here? Not really. We see Josh Berry here, and you might be like, oh, that's kind of weird. Barry's uh, 11th, that's kind of odd, but when you look at the last, I just X'd out of it, didn't I? Oh no, give me a moment. When you look at the last three short tracks, less than a mile races we've been at, okay, you see, uh, we'll bring this closer, uh, as I said, this is where they finished at Richmond earlier in the year, and you're like, oh my god, like, what the fuck is Josh Berry, what is Gregson doing, these guys suck, this is out of nowhere, then you look at these and you're like, wow, you know what, like, Barry, hmm, that wasn't a fluke of him just getting 11th at Richmond. If anything, Childers and, and, and Barry, like, showed up and raced pretty decently at these other tracks. Okay? Same thing here. Like, oh, man, like, oh, this isn't including the old ra Like, we're looking at the same guys. Like, this is nothing crazy, okay? So, for me, when I'm, when that, this is why I typically like looking at recent form more. Now, yet again, I've just... I've just sucked ass at short tracks, like building for short. I always seem to get something wrong in some aspect. But when I'm looking at this here, like, this is a good indication of where the current form is at for these guys. We're seeing that, you know, oh, the previous Richmond race, like, it's not even included in this data. It would still be pushing the same guys here. Are we seeing anything out of the ordinary here? Are we seeing anything crazy? No, this is where guys are at, and we're seeing that, you know, we're seeing that the Fords have been making significant changes in some form or fashion like and it's not even a sense of like oh where do they come from you know and this is including like Logano winning at 
Nashville. Like, who cares about that? But it's it's a situation where like Toyota and Chevy were, you know, clearly the better team for a significant period in this next gen car. RFK, you know, took over as the primary Ford team. But we're seeing that, you know, Fords in general. And those teams are slowly catching up. I mean, you know, shout out to SHR, you know, deciding to really show up right, you know, when the team's shutting down and stuff. But when, when I'm looking at these races here, like, when I compare, like, where these guys are at compared to what their salary should probably end up being, we're probably going to get a discount on somebody like Tyler Reddick on Chastain. Kozlowski might be a bit overpriced. We're clearly going to see, you know, Truex Jr. be overpriced. And you could argue that, oh, but, it, you know, it's Truex at, at Richmond who can argue. And so, like, we can clearly understand that that Martin, that Truex Jr. will probably be easily, like, probably the third or second most expensive guy. And when I'm kind of just looking here, I'm like, you know, that might be, you know, a situation where I might want less interest in Truex Jr. And yet again, this is uh, on Wednesday with currently no practice data, not knowing the grid. Clearly, if we get practice through Saturday, hey, we're going to have a pretty good idea of where these guys are at, okay? Um, we understand that this race is going to be dictated by what the tires are doing or what or what, when, uh, what strategy guys are on tires and stuff. So if people are, you know, splitting the stage, putting twice in the stage, if we get a random yellow at some odd point, which we don't typically see at Richmond, but, you know, it could happen because this last Richmond race did have a late race yellow with, uh, you know, these guys wrecking for last, uh, shout out Bubba Wallace and... Uh, Kyle Larson here that drastically did change the uh, the outcome of the race because we did get another restart here. Um, but for the most part, and again, this is just based by finishing position here. And so we see like, you know, place difference coming through of, you know, clear dominance of Joe Gibbs, you know, when to be there. Or Joe Gibbs, you know, having cars because Bell goes from 29th, passes through the field. We have Hamlin going through the field. Like that. that's expected, right? Um, and then guys who start up front who – you know, you wouldn't expect to, like, have good cars like Bubba Wallace, okay? Look, if Bubba Wallace is, like, $8,000, I'm not going to play him. If you start in fifth, like, this situation, like, what is, you know, I've been watching NASCAR for, you know, about a year and a half now. Like, when has Bubba Wallace ever actually won a race? Like, what what kind of disappointments is this fella going through, man? Like, Just, just situation like that. And so anyway, when, when I'm looking at Richmond, I look at like where guys started last time or earlier this year, guys who like, you know, kind of didn't deserve to be up there and stuff like Chastain starting third, like probably not a good play. Hindsight would kind of dictate that. Now I'm saying, you know, that because he's like ranked ninth here. We're not seeing him, you know, overtake, you know, the favorites and stuff like that. And so, you know, I'm not trying to just speak in, in you know, and haikus or whatever, but like Joe Gibbs is the favorite entering this race, like the favorite team. Um, but like, I'm probably not interested in Byron. I'm probably not interested in Bowman. I'm probably not interested um, in Ty Gibbs. And I'm saying this in a sense of like, it's Joe Gibbs as the favorite with Hendrick probably second. And then I think it's wide open actually for some four teams to, to break in there, whether it be RFK and stuff. But I'm indicating, like, I'm not interested in Gibbs. I'm not interested in Byron. not interested in, in Bowman. So from Hendrick, it's just Elliott and it's just Larson. From Joe Gibbs, it's Bell, Hamlin, Truex. And I'm going to probably say that, you know, based on where these guys are at, Bell is probably the better Joe Gibbs car here. He'll probably be the third cheapest because it's probably going to go Truex, Hamlin, Bell, and then Gibbs. And so, like, Bell probably makes a lot of sense here for us to probably want to get exposure to. Um, and yet again, looking at, you know, what we can do at Richmond versus other tracks, we can identify, like, right off the bat of value plays who are going to do some wild and stupid stuff, okay? And that can be very much indicated by, hell, even if we go back and look at these, if we if we include more races here, this is a situation where I'm perfectly fine, you know, diluting my, um, you know, data point with more laps. Because when you start looking at this here, we'll look at uh, we'll look at the last, uh, we'll do eight. And we're not looking at the top of the field. We don't really care if guys have won or not, because yet again, this is being, you know, including data that has Bristol and Dover. But when you start looking at the value plays and who is viable, who are teams that are stretching 
um, you know, strategy, you're trying to do something. This is where colleague comes into play. This is where front row comes into play. This is where spire comes into play. When you start looking at laps led from guys who are like doing nothing, like, oh, Josh Berry's leading laps. When did he lead laps in these races? What is going on here? Oh, yeah, he led lap. He led 25 at Bristol. Strategy race, getting different. He leads two at Richmond during a green flag run, which I'm assuming is a green flag run, and then got off sequence at Iowa. Okay, and that's children trying to do something different. When we look at, you know, Bubba Wallace, Todd Golan, Suarez, Michael McDowell, Sin, I don't recall if Cindric was a strategy one. Let's go ahead and take a gander. Uh, no, it was not because he started first uh, at Gateway. Uh, but we look at uh, Kyle Bush is basically Dean Thompson, uh, so that's kind of null and void for this point here. But LaJoy... Leading laps, where is, uh, we don't even have Hemrick here. So, like, Hemrick leading five, like, we, we can look at the value plays with potential upside of getting lucky with when a yellow comes out or just getting laps led or getting fast laps off, off sequence. Because if you're looking at somebody like, let me look at this race at Richmond. We find somebody who led laps who maybe didn't deserve to. We see Bubba Wallace lead two. We see Barry lead two. Uh... Probably not. I'm gonna have to gonna have to make some stuff happen here. We're looking at Barry leads from 172. That's a yellow. We look at Wallace from 49. Right off the start, coming out of a the rain yellow. I'm wanting to find an example here. I don't think like I. It's easier to show at 1.5 because I know exactly where they're leading here. But let's see, this Chris Busher, I'm trying to find an example of like Suarez, like Suarez for example. Like when we look at where Suarez is leading here, I don't know if this was uh, 55, another yellow flag here. Okay, so I'm not just able to find that data right off the bat. But when we're looking at a place like Richmond, you know, and teams are getting different, hoping for yellows, Spire, Hemrick, or Spire, Colleague, and stuff like that. Not only are they staying out of potentially lean lap, front row would probably be a better example here. Let me Let me find a front row. We'll find McDowell because I doubt he's getting that not off strategy. So let's see here. He may have led a gateway. Started first to gateway. We got to find Gillowan. Sorry, I'm trying to trying to make a point here, but we are struggling to find a point that is concrete here. Okay, so this is a perfect example of like this is straight up. You know, uh, maybe not. Don't remember Phoenix. Can't remember that off the top of my head. But like Loudon, for example, him leading 19 this has to be during a. Weird sequence. 126. Yeah, so one yeah, so this 126 is directly in a green flag run, which we can just see here, so I don't have to go through and get my stupid lap by lap data to go through this, which I probably should have done. Anyway, anyway, Dylan's running long here to get off sequence. You know, leads 19 laps. Hey, you know what also happens at Richmond? Okay, whatever. You lead laps or you get off sequence, you gain position, you run long. Okay, maybe you don't get a ton of lap led, but when you pit and you see the fall off that even the leaders are having, we're going to see fast laps spread out amongst the field. And so when you start looking at your 5K drivers, the Spire, the Collie guys, front row guys, maybe not even value, but you know what I mean, like these guys have upside of not only, you know, starting in the back of the field and, you know, passing enough place differential to get like a 4-9 value or whatever. If they get off sequence, they are pretty much guaranteed like three to five fast laps and three to five fast laps from somebody in the 5k range 6k range is pretty huge um and so when we're looking at this richmond race for the cup series okay this is the general order i would rank people entering you could argue no i mean this is tricks is clearly being carried down just because of the tracks we're using here but like this is this is pretty much where everybody should go in at and where people are, are based at and so when we start looking at where you know, the back markers should go, you know, and people that are probably going to start the back of the field and try and get different here, you know. Now, the legacy guys have had a ton of bad luck. They've been involved in a lot of wrecks. Jones and Nemechek have both been almost the exact opposite of, like, Hemrick, for example, who's been a beneficiary of, of yellows throughout the season. The opposite is pretty much true for Nemechek. Like, Nemechek is legacy has also been very aggressive on getting off sequence, but they've almost always been caught up in crashes and stuff. And so when we're looking at, you know, even guys like 
Nemechek, Jones, like I think they're very much in play too to get off sequence and stuff. Um, and so when I'm looking at the value range, I'm actually weighing that much more heavily at a place like Richmond to where tire fall off is going to be huge. These guys are already going to be in the back of the field. You know, they're, they're most likely not competing for a lead lap finish anyway. They're just trying to get different. And so him, Rick, I don't even know what the, let me see who's in this race really fast. So like when we're looking at this race here, like Hemrick is probably honestly my favorite value just entering the entering the week. Hemrick for sure. Haley and um, it's not Cody Ware. That sucks, man. Herbs. I mean the like the the Rick Ware cheat code. If you're not playing Justin Haley, if you're not playing Cody Ware, like you need exposure to Riley Herbs this week just based on the pricing and what. Rick Ware has been able to do in this team in general. Like, they have absolutely been performing and finding to be not even, like, viable. Like, they can be up one. I think if more people were playing them, they'd probably be scoring a lot better uh, than, you know, getting, you know, some racing play like Nemechek. I know I just mentioned him of how he's being caught up and stuff, but if you just, like, didn't play anybody but Justin Haley and Cody Ware in the last few weeks and even this year, like, you would probably be up a lot of money. Like... So when I'm looking at value plays this weekend, entering like who I actually like, I really like Hemrick, not based on any track data at all, but it's based on the fact that he's been able to gain position throughout races and they're going to try and get off sequence. There's real chance, like I would, I don't know if you could bet it realistically, this is just kind of me being out loud, I would bet Hemrick leads laps in this race on a long green flag run. Same thing with McDowell, same thing with Gill and um, Corey LaJoy, Probably in that same category of people who could lead laps under green just based on strategy alone. That's going to get off sequence. Like, that's how you want to build at the bottom with your um, value play. What is Parker doing? Why is Parker in this MBM car? Why are you wasting your time with this Parker? Get out of here, dude. That's just stupid. Matt, why are we even wasting time here um, with that? That's so dumb. Um, but, yeah, so, like, that's where we're at here. You know, as I said, I like, it, like, I, I'm, I'm assuming that you know how to do research. Like, you're very much aware that like Hamlin and Truex are probably the favorites entering this race. Like, I don't, I don't need to tell you that. Okay, I'm just coming at this of like, how do I, or what do I want to not even do to purposely be contrarian or different, but what are aspects that I want to look at or be aware of entering this race? And you know, that's how I got to this video here. Um, Yet again, we got to see where these guys qualify. We got to see what their speeds are in practice, because uh, I think that'll be a good indication of where the top guys are going to be separating themselves. Like if you are deciding between a Trex or a Hamlin or a Bell, like what data point is going to, you know, force you to go a different direction, and or will that lead to more ownership on certain guys? You know, um, I was listening to to Nerdy and some of the other guys from In Game talk about the ownership on some uh, this is more so for like MMA and stuff um, but I think it does pertain to racing and it's kind of the same conversation that I've been having with myself and I even had with Sheets d debating the higher ownership for the like the truck series and the Xfinity series like when there's a chalk guy coming through or chalk place differential plays coming through and they're like you know pushing you know higher ownership and stuff that we aren't necessarily seeing in the cup series, but this might be a situation like I, I'm, I'm bringing this up because if there's a situation in practice to where like Trix is like fucking fast, like the fastest guy and people are already on him in general could be a situation where he like pushes like 44, 40% ownership and stuff. Um, and I think that is probably a combination of the idea of exploiting the field of like playing chalk guys. Like if somebody was chalky, it's because they have a high likelihood of working out, right? Well, you know, a lot of people used to be, you know, over the field on them and stuff, like double the field or whatever. Because stuff was showing that like, oh, that's, you know, a good way. That's probably where you should be on that line or, or with that driver or whatever. And since we're seeing that move, you know, really it's like the truck series specifically, um, I forgot the point I was going to make. Oh, I think it, I think it is related to like Sims and contest Sims and results like that. I think that is why we're seeing more uh, ownership on like certain guys 
maybe not necessarily for Cup. This is probably more for like a two, the two lower series discussions here. But like that Luke guy, or the guy with the last name L, who raced for uh, Thor Sport like a, a month ago or something, and he like, I, you know, he he was like expected to push like super high ownership, and it made like really no sense, um, out of nowhere. I think that's more contest sims and sims related because things like whenever you're running that stuff it's going to show you guys who are like more likely to work out than not and it's going to want you to play those guys more and i think that's driving an aspect of ownership um i'm just kind of rambling at this point this is probably a better discussion for you know a live audience and stuff um but anyway when i'm looking at this race here the reason i'm bringing that up is i think we might run into a situation like that if in practice we see the Joe Gibbs cars and specifically Truex or Hamlin be like drastically faster than everybody else. Uh, ownership might truly centralize on them. And like at a game theory standpoint, you know, now Truex is already entering as the favorite. If he gets pushed more, same thing with Hamlin. Like, fuck, man, I think ROI, you just you play Bell. You'd like, I like Bell more, you know? And it goes back to me, and this isn't, you know, trying to like, retroactively say that this is the data that's going to be right but i think bell's like a really good play man i think elliot's a good play i think larson's a good play and uh we probably might see a discount on those three individuals because truex and hamlin might carry so much there's a lot of stuff to work a work around with work around with at the bottom of the salary with the two where entries the colleague entry or entries um the spire cars like, those are the value teams that I would want to work with. So you have the two Rick Ware guys, the two Kali cars, the three Spire cars. That's seven values, like, right there. Like, those are those should be the only values you realistically consider or use. Probably double punt with two of them, you know. And then get up and try and chase as many potential lap leaders as possible. Like, I think this is a race to where unless, you know, Q or projections are showing, let's, like, you know play the mid-range, like, I kind of want to do very much a Stars and Scrubs type of build of, you know, 10K guys, you know, big favorites with those value guys. And, because punts typically come through easier on short tracks with the amount of laps we're running, why would we not play the Rick Ware cars? Why would we not play the Collie cars? Why would we not play the Spire cars? Like, value upside of them actually finishing races, value upside of them getting off strategy, potentially leading laps, getting off strategy in general, potentially getting fast laps and stuff, and well, we'll throw a front row in there, but McDowell will probably be mid range, and Gillen's probably going to be you know higher six K guys. If he's lower, then Gillen's probably a great play. Um, but that's that's where I'm at uh, entering this Richmond weekend for like the Cup Series and my thoughts for the Truck Series and stuff like that. I'll be live this weekend, uh, Saturday afternoon, uh, before the Truck Series race, then Sunday morning. Uh, unless, you know, things change and we got a doubleheader Monday or whatever. But that is that is the uh, that is the plan for my live shows. These are my thoughts of just things I want to be aware of approaching this race uh, and probably situations where I want to be more aggressive in terms of, you know, truly chasing value guys and, and trying to get um, more expensive fellows and stuff. I don't know. That's just my thoughts. You know, we've been off for three weeks, and this is kind of, you know, where, where I'm at uh, looking at Richmond. Uh, and then we're at Michigan, which is lame. And then we got the big Daytona race. Like everybody, just put all, just put all your money towards Daytona. Just three weeks away, two weeks away, play Daytona. Put your life savings in Daytona. Just, just it's much more. Like we're seeing so much volatility and so much variance on these stupid 1.5s and even these short tracks. We get a late race yellow and shit just hits the fan. Like just play Daytona. Oh my god, play the guys from the back of Daytona. And just call it a month. Call it B. That's August. Okay, August is made and broke. Hell, fucking the second half of the DFS year before football is made and broke at Daytona. Like, what are we doing? Don't put a lot of money at these races. Just put it all at Daytona. I'll see you guys. I'll see you guys in the live shows.